Okay. All right. Well, we'll get started. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us for Grand Rounds for our uh, very first Grand Rounds on Zoom. Um, so hopefully everybody here has managed to um, navigate uh, that platform, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to moving forward in this. Um, so the theme of this week is mentorship and menteeship, um, and it's very appropriate that uh, this week, we, uh, the Office for Faculty Affairs and Development just uh, put out their new guide for mentorship and promotion guidelines. Um, we'll be posting that URL in the chat. Um, so please uh, avail yourself of that resource um, and uh, take a look at it. So today we have um, our special uh, medical grand round speaker, Dr. Valerie Vaughn. And to introduce Dr. Vaughn, we have Dr. Ann Sheehy, our division chief of general internal medicine, of, sorry, of hospital medicine. <laughs> Dr. Sheehy, you're on. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Um, it is my great pleasure this morning to welcome Dr. Valerie Vaughn to the University of Wisconsin Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Dr. Vaughn is an assistant professor and director of hospital medicine research at the University of Utah. Dr. Vaughn completed her bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry at Duke University, followed by her MD internal medicine residency and chief residency at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. She then completed a master's degree in health and health services research and a hospital medicine research fellowship at the University of Michigan in 2017. She subsequently stayed on staff at the University of Michigan until last October at which time she re relocated to the University of Utah as an assistant professor of medicine and director of hospital medicine research. Her research focuses on improving the safety of hospitalized patients by reducing antibiotic overuse, particularly during transitions of care, which is the focus of her most recent grant funding. She has received multiple awards in this space, including having two articles in the top 10 stewardship publications at 2019 IDSA ID Week, and she has also been recognized by the Society of Hospital Medicine with their National Award of Excellence in Teamwork and QI in 2019. She is also nationally recognized for her work in mentorship, which is the topic she will speak about today. She has studied academic mentorship and is an author on the book, The Mentoring Guide, Helping Mentors and Mentees Succeed, and of the JAMA article, Mentee Missteps, Tales from the Academic Trenches. In addition to serving as a mentor, both locally and nationally, Dr. Vaughn co-founded a women's peer mentorship group at the University of Michigan and leads a clinical hospitalist research mentorship program at the University of Utah, both with goals to help members access the tools and relationships necessary for career success. Dr. Vaughn has given multiple national talks on these topics and has 38 peer reviewed publications in journals such as JAMA, JAMA Internal Medicine, JAMA Network Open, Annals of Internal Medicine, BMJ Quality and Safety, and the Journal of Hospital Medicine. I am personally very excited to hear Dr. Valerie Vaughn speak with us today at Medicine Grand Rounds with her talk titled Mastering Mentorship and Menteeship in Academic Medicine. Dr. Vaughn. Wow, thank you so much. That was a very glowing recommend, or, uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and and I, I wanna thank you for, for having me here today. You know, talking about mentorship is one of my favorite things that I do. Um, I feel like mentorship is so key to our success as uh, academic faculty. Um, and it's also one of the reasons I, I feel like most of us choose to stay in academic medicine is both because we love kind of the community around us and, and being able to learn from other people, but we also really love kind of this idea of informal teaching of the next generation and kind of mentoring forward. So um, I, I know that uh, it's, it's something that a lot of people have experience with and a lot of people really enjoy. And so the goal in kind of talking through things today is really to try to provide a little bit of a framework for some structure that can improve all of our skills, both as mentors and as mentees, um, as we think about how mentorship uh, works and can help us both uh, personally in our careers, but then also help grow our networks and uh, help support the next generation who's coming up in medicine. Um, so with that in mind, uh, the overview today, I'm going to talk just briefly about what mentorship actually is and, and provide kind of a definition for that. And then I'm going to talk about some good habits for uh, mentees as well as for mentors. 
And then one thing that I think is really important, especially with everything that kind of has been going on and the growing recognition of the importance of diversity and equity, is to talk about how we can proactively and thoughtfully use the um, power that we have as mentors and as sponsors to really be proactive in how we mentor and how we sponsor to really help support people and support the missions of diversity and equity. And then I'll talk briefly, uh, Dr. Sheehy mentioned the program that uh, we're developing and that I'm leading for clinical faculty here at the University of Utah. So I'll talk briefly about that program um, and some of the successes and ways that I think that could be something that potentially could serve as a model for other places interesting, interested in kind of growing um, their research uh, efforts as well. So let's talk first about mentorship and specifically kind of what is mentorship. One of the definitions I've seen that I really love um, is, is this one from uh, Healy, who said that mentorship is a dynamic reciprocal relationship and in work environment between an advanced career incumbent or mentor and a beginner or mentee aimed at promoting the career development of both. And the reason I love this is because it talks a lot about the um, reciprocity piece of this, because I think often we think of mentors as people who, who give in one direction, but mentors also learn a lot from being in a relationship um, with a mentee. You know, they get an infusion of new ideas. They get kind of creation of their legacy, expansion of their network, um, and really just a fresh new perspective to make sure that, especially, you know, in research, you kind of want to be on the the cutting edge of the field and having mentees can be a really great way of doing that. And then of course, mentees benefit quite a bit from having mentors and, and often through developing critical thinking skills, advice on research ideas, scholarship and network opportunities. I think it's a little bit more clear what mentees get from this, but I wanna keep in mind that, and for me, especially actually during the pandemic, um, when you're working kind of 80, 90, 100 hours a week during really bad episodes of COVID, the times that kind of reinvigorated me and kept my um, spirits up were really the, the small periods of time I got to spend with my mentees um, outside of kind of the, the crushing times that could sometimes happen around COVID. So it's also, I think, a really good thing for, for burnout and for um, kind of overall feelings of satisfaction and well being. So traditionally, people kind of thought as, of mentorship as this uh, relationship between kind of one mentor and one mentee. But I really think that there should be a more expansive view of this. Um, and there have really been kind of four archetypes of mentorship that have been defined. Um, and th these definitions actually come from an article from my old mentor at the University of uh, Michigan, Vineet Chopra, in an article he wrote in JAMA in 2017. And what he noted was that really mentorship is more of a team sport, that it's really hard nowadays to find everything you need in one single person. And so it's really helpful to kind of think of a number of people and think of your mentorship team. And there are really four types of people that should belong on your team, the mentor, the coach, the sponsor, and the connector. And I'll talk about each of those separately. The mentor is um, someone who guides. So this is kind of your traditional one-to-one one -one career development. This could be a person who, if you're in a, on a track that requires grants or writing that really helps write with manuscripts or with grants, if you're on kind of an educational track or um, a, cl a clinical track, maybe someone who kind of provides um, overall career guidance about how to get kind of from step A to step B. On the other hand, the coach is someone who comes in maybe for a targeted area of feedback. So let's say that you're going for a job talk. Um, the coach can be someone who helps kind of hone your job talk skills and talk about your presentation skills. Um, if you're, again, if you're more on like a research track, a coach could be a methodologist that helps you kind of with the methods for a single project, but doesn't necessarily kind of stay with you for a long period of time. So the coach can kind of come in and help with one skill set, but really isn't looking at the overall picture. The sponsor is really important and something that um, in particular research has shown that uh, sponsorship is something that's really limited for underrepresented minorities, for people of color and for women. Um, and so this is something that we'll talk about more lately, later that is really important to be proactive when you start becoming spo a sponsor and thinking about how you sponsor other voices. So in general, the sponsor is someone who nominates. And so that can be nominating you for a talk, nominating you for a national committee, nominating you for a position, but really they use their influence to increase your, your visibility. 
Um, and in doing so, they're hoping to kind of improve their own brand, right? If they put good people forward, then they're known as someone who has access to the good people. Um, and, and if it's a division chief or a chair, for example, a sponsor, um, uh, working in that capacity is really helping to try to kind of grow the brand of their division or their department. The connector is a person who gets a thrill out of kind of knowing two people who don't know each other and then bringing them together to create something better. So, you know, traditionally, I, I think the connector was often thought about as also someone very senior who kind of knows everything going on in the field and can identify two people doing work and bring them together. But also in today's like modern age of Twitter and social media, sometimes connectors are people who are more junior, but just have a really good social media following and know that there's someone kind of across the country or across the world doing the same kind of work that you're doing and can really bring you guys together to have a conversation and collaborate. And then there's the fifth archetype, which wasn't mentioned in the article, but I think I found personally has been very important as well to my career growth. And that's been the peer mentor. And so um, this is a group of uh, my peer women's mentorship group back at the University of Michigan. And we'd meet once a month to have uh, dinner and talk about what we called our successes and failures. So it was a group of women. And we know that notoriously kind of women aren't as good at uh, uh, you know, tooting their own horn. And uh, so we were all required to unabashedly embrace the success and kind of brag about it with each other. And then um, the, the failure part of it was we'd all kind of bring up something we'd been struggling with and get perspective from kind of near peers about how to adjust that. And I think this was helpful, not just because it provided really practical uh, hands-on advice, but also, you know, with, uh, um, for us, there weren't necessarily a lot of women in leadership who could act as senior mentors. And so sometimes, you know, problem solving uh, advice from men may be different than what works for women. And so, so we found kind of using the shared knowledge of the group of us to help uh, overcome problems was really helpful. Um, and this was actually something that we were easily kind of able to transfer to, to Zoom during the pandemic. And it's been really helpful for keeping in touch. Um, and this is one of our kind of uh, recent meetings um, where we were kind of doing the same thing. So um, really uh, these five kind of types of mentors can come together and really help kind of support a career. And so I think it's really helpful to kind of think about who, and, and one person might be multiple of these people to you, you know? So often the, the sponsor and the mentor can be the same person, but it's also true that roles can kind of change over time. So things like your, your mentors change, whether they're promoted, which can make people kind of have less time if they're moving into a higher position or if they're changing fields or focus, Changing institutions can also make it harder for them to provide the same amount of time that they used to. But then mentees needs can also change. Either they move into a new area and perhaps need new coaches or develop new career goals and need different sponsors. And then there's also the transition where mentees start becoming mentors. And so these are all kind of important things to keep in mind that all of this is kind of flexible and movable and shouldn't be considered something to be done in stone. But I do think it's helpful to have some reflection about kind of what categories you have um, in your mentorship team. And like I said, sometimes one person feels, fills multiple roles. And then think about which categories, if any, are you missing? And is there somebody that you could add kind of to your mentorship team to help fill that? And then also think about your own mentorship style. And when you're serving as a mentor, what category most fits your style? You know, some people really like um, connecting people, you know, they get a thrill out of being very social and knowing everybody and bringing people together. Um, other people really like getting in the weeds about one topic, you know, they know something really well, and maybe they serve as a coach who can give that skill to other people. Um, but other people, you know, like acting kind of in this career development role, which uh, may fit the more traditional kind of mentorship role. So, you know, it's really helpful to kind of slow down and think for a moment about your style and um, also about your team and who, who's there and who you still need. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about menteeship. And I think this is helpful whether you're a mentor or a mentee because often mentees don't know kind of the best skills to become a, a great mentee. And so it's on the mentor often to help establish some of the 
uh, rules and guidance to, to help mentees kind of make the most out of the mentoring relationship. Um, so let's talk about the four golden rules of menteeship. And again, this is an article by uh, Vineet Chopra and also Sanjay Saint, uh, one of my um, sponsors, I would say, at the University of Michigan, who I worked very closely with for years. And they talked about kind of the four golden rules of menteeship. And the first, and we'll go over each of those in a little more detail, but the first is to select the right mentor. And again, because mentorship is a team, that often means selecting more than one person. The second is be respectful of the mentor's time. We'll talk more about that. Communicate effectively, which is really critically important, both for mentors and mentees. And then for mentees, it's really helpful to be engaged and energized. So I stole this mnemonic from Vineet Arora, um, another hospitalist who is absolutely amazing, is actually giving a talk at the Society of Hospital Medicine with me on mentorship and diversity. Um, but Vineet pointed out that when you're looking for a mentor, it's often helpful to think of the mnemonic CAPE. So first off, is the mentor someone who's capable? Have they mentored? Do they know the area? Are they someone that um, you know, has had success in the past? Are they available to you? This one's really important because often people choose kind of the most senior person in their field or someone who's known as an expert. But if that person is too busy to kind of do some of the day-to-day -day, um, help, that person might actually be better as a sponsor than as a direct mentor. Do they have a project that's actually of interest to you? You know, again, think about the amount of time that has to go into like a project that you're working on or whatever, that can take years. And so you don't wanna just do it because you like the person, but you also wanna be really interested in the work. And then are they easy to get along with? Here, we often do what we call a, a little background check um, where you talk to other mentees that have worked with them before. And so that, that's helpful, not just because you can get an idea of whether they're a good mentor, but also maybe get some tips and advice about how to make that mentoring relationship work a little bit better. The second rule is to be respectful of your mentor's time. So um, as people, you know, kind of are more senior and get to be more sen senior, their, their time is uh, much, much more limited. And so I think it's always super helpful to get on someone's calendar by having kind of regular cadence of meetings that are scheduled out maybe six months or a year in advance. Um, and then sending agendas to them. So about somewhere between three to five days before I meet with any of my mentors or before any of my mentees meet with me, we have an agenda sent out. And the agenda has what items kind of we're gonna be talking about. And as a mentor, I really like it because if there's anything on there that I don't know the answer to or that I need to talk to someone about ahead of time, I can do that. And so it kind of allows me to do my homework ahead of time. And as a mentee, I like agendas too, because it keeps me honest. It makes, makes sure that like, if there is a problem going on that I actually bring it up because I've already kind of proactively put it on my agenda. Um, and uh, the, the other thing that's really helpful is to ask for feedback in small bites, you know, sending an entire manuscript or an entire grant or an entire curriculum in one go it's just not gonna be something that your mentor is gonna be able to do. And then providing adequate notice. I think this is also something that's missed. You know, when deadlines come up, that deadline is not uh, the deadline for your mentor. <laughs> you know, you need, to, you need to subtract some time from deadlines to make sure that you're giving your mentor adequate time to kind of do something ahead of time. So when emails are written, I always in instruct that you should say when something is due and make sure you give someone at least at least a week, but preferably to, to get back to you um, just because of how busy people can be. And then communication is key. I think before you, you know, even think about the day-to-day -day communication, letting your mentorship team know about your goals and aspirations is really helpful. This is especially true when it comes to sponsors. They can't sponsor you for things if they don't know what you're interested in. And then most communication should be during meetings. That's what the agendas are about. They help have kind of more complex conversations. Um, but if you're gonna write an email, make sure it's kind of very quick to the point, short and concise, because people are often reading it on an email. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, you can use agendas both as a template. This is especially true if you have a very, for example, uh, talkative mentor to kind of keep them on track and within the time frame. And then for, for people who are maybe a little bit more conflict avoiding, avoidant, agendas can also be helpful to kind of bring up something that's going bad um, and make sure to keep yourself accountable that you actually talk about it. 
And then finally, be engaged, energizing, and collaborative. Um, and, and generally, you know, I, I mentioned already that the re none of us get paid to be mentors for the most part. And so what we do it because we enjoy it. And so it's really helpful, I think, as a mentee to think about the fact that, you know, as much as you can, trying to be positive um, instead of negative, being an energy donor, not a recipient. And, you know, it's, it's up to you to kind of drive your project along. If, if your mentor is having to, like, continuously hold you count, accountable and remind you of deadlines and keep you on track, that's just going to sap some of their emotional energy instead of helping them um, uh, feel better about things. And that can be very, very dangerous uh, and, and reduce kind of the incentive for a mentor to keep mentoring. Um, being a closer, so finished projects that you actually start on. Um, and one of the, the, the famous kind of phrases is to under promise and over deliver. So if you think you can get something done in a week, tell them it's going to be two weeks and then get it done in a week and you can really wow them. And so, you know, I, I mentioned all of this, not to say that we should be promoting kind of toxic positivity, but I do think there's a time and a place for bringing up kind of the negative aspects. I actually think talking, this is one of the reasons that peers are really helpful is because those are people that you can talk about some of the, the issues and maybe do some of the complaining with. But with the mentor, if you're going to bring up a problem, it needs to be so that you can brainstorm a constructive solution, um, not just to complain. And so, um, you know, those are kind of the ideal habits. I want to touch briefly about some of the mistakes that can happen too. And these actually come from an article I wrote in uh, JAMA back in 2017 and came from this kind of universal angst that a lot of my, myself and my peer group had been feeling about some mistakes that we had made um, as mentees. And part of it was that we wanted to understand uh, what were the system versus personal issues that came up when it came to like career advancement and navigating kind of what it meant to be junior faculty at an academic institution. And although there are definitely system issues that contribute to some of the problems, you know, if you can identify what the personal issues are, you can actually help uh, overcome them. Right, so it's very hard as junior faculty to fight the system, but there are some things that personally uh, we could do to kind of help overcome some of the things that uh, we were causing problems with. And so that's kind of where this came from. And, and one of the things that came up as an origin of mistakes was that there were really two kind of uh, origins. One was lacking confidence and the other one was conflict aversion. So lacking confidence here, I mean to say behaviors that were uh, kind of due to a desire to appear infallible um, and often rooted in kind of a fear of failure. You know, um, especially in academic medicine, a lot of us are very kind of um, have done well all of our lives and are used to success and kind of coming up um, around this, you know, maybe starting to make mistakes, doing things that are a little more, bit more difficult can be very difficult uh, for, for all of us. And so, um, you know, a lot of us have heard this kind of feeling um, described as the imposter syndrome. So this idea that, you know, you're, you're moving along and you got here by accident and people are gonna realize that you're a fake at any moment and you're gonna be discovered. Um, but the other way I like to think about this is by saying that people have uh, potentially a fixed mindset. And this is actually from Carol Dweck, um, who thought of this idea of fixed versus growth mindset and described it first in children actually and said that the fixed mindset is this idea that we kind of have an innate sense of characteristics. And if there's something that comes along and kind of challenges that, for example, maybe you innately think that you're really smart, but if something comes along and you make a mistake, that can completely challenge your entire self-worth. Um, the growth mindset, on the other hand, is this idea that you are, you can become anything and you learn by making mistakes. And so when mistakes happen, they're seen more as a growth opportunity instead of this proof that maybe you're not worth it after all. And so kind of switching from this idea of fixed mindset to growth mindset, I think is really important and trying to reframe our mistakes as learning opportunities. And we can do that both personally, but we can also help our mentees kind of move from thinking about mistakes as something that means they need to leave medicine and quit altogether to something that just shows that, that, that they're learning. And that's a, an important part of a career goal growth, no matter if you're a trainee or even a faculty member. So there are a couple ways that kind of lacking confidence can manifest. One of them is, uh, um, can be 
very kind of draining on the mentor, and that's the vampire who drains the lifeblood of the mentor, typified by countless emails, phone calls, and meeting requests. This is someone that uh, has the knowledge to make the decisions, but doesn't have the confidence to make any of them. And then the opposite phenotype can also help happen with the lone wolf. So, so they may appear confident, but really what happens is they're afraid of asking for help because they think asking for help makes them appear weak or foolish. But the problem is, is that they can make kind of catastrophic mistakes by going their own path without asking for help uh, for things that could be easily averted. And then the third type is the backstabber. Um, this is someone who may perform well, but if something comes up, not only do they uh, create a lot of excuses, but they might actually put that failure onto someone else instead of owning it. Um, and so it's obviously very important to develop the skills of kind of um, owning your own mistakes and also owning uh, the solution to those mistakes. And then the other side of things is conflict aversion. So these are behaviors that stem from a desire to please or distaste for confrontation. And so you often see conflict averse mentees as people who are kind of like known as yes people. Um, and this can often work out okay, but they can bury or hide their own interests in favor of the interests of others. And though it might work initially, it can lead to burnout or career disillusionment. And I think some, some of uh, all of us probably have a little bit of conflict aversion in us, in part because the um, environment that we're in is very hierarchical. And so conflict aversion is kind of trained into us. And so um, the, the three main kind of phenotypes of this, and I'm sure we've all been some of these at some point in our life, is the overcommitter who says yes to everything, but then has high output failure due to lack of prioritization and development. The ghost who hides and kind of avoids conflict and hopes that their mistakes or poor performance go in, unnoticed. Or the doormat who is often on the opposite side of an exploitative mentor and is often used but seldom recognized and often takes on tasks without being recognized for their contribution. And so if we were here in person, I would kind of go through the next case together as a group, but I'd like you still to kind of think about what your response would be on your own to this. So let's say you had a mentor who was looking for someone to help lead the development of a new project in your division. Your mentor turns to you and lets you know they've been having a difficult time finding someone and thinks that you would be great. On the one hand, it's not something you're really interested in doing, and you're already swamped with your other projects. But on the other hand, your mentor seems to really need the help, and maybe it won't be too much work. So take a moment and think for yourself about what you would do. Would you agree to lead the project? If not, how do you say no without ruining kind of the relationship and letting your mentor down? And how do you kind of offset this in the future? You know, what can prevent this in the future? What could be contributing to this problem now? So if everyone kind of takes a moment to think about this, you know, I think all the time we get asked to do things that um, are not the thing we wanna do the most in our lives. And so um, some of the best advice I've heard around things like this is, first off, I think step one is not to make an immediate decision. Right? The answer is always kind of find out more information first. So why is this opportunity being offered to you? Maybe your mentor is actually thinking about how this can help you get to your next goal, this kind of pathway, but just isn't kind of expressing that pathway very well and, and you can't see it. So ask some more clarifying questions. So what, why is this opportunity good? Why are you the person that they're thinking of of this? What exactly does the opportunity entail? What kind of support comes with the opportunity? Those questions can be really helpful kind of on the, um, on the outset, just to make sure it may be actually that, oh yeah, you're right. This is a great opportunity for me. Absolutely, I wanna take part in it. But then let's say you hear all of the reasoning why, and it's still not something that sounds right for you. This is a good moment where it depends kind of on the amount of work, right? So if it is actually something that is a huge amount of work, which is typically what these things end up being, then maybe you want to figure out a way to say no. But if it's something small that can help build up goodwill um, in your mentor or in your boss, then it's actually something that maybe you want to just do and say yes to. But um, let's say it's in that, that first situation where it's actually something that you've decided is best to say no. One of the ways that I found really helpful to kind of combat this is actually to, to bring that up to your mentor and say, you know, this seems like a good opportunity, but you know, I've got a lot of things on my, my plate right now. And as you know, our top priority for me this year is to do A. 
I, I don't see how this fits in with that. You know, could you explain a little bit more to me? Or is there something on my list of items that you'd like me to drop in order to focus more on this? You know, and then when they see that, you know, you already are kind of full on your plate and everything else is really important to them as well, maybe they say, oh, never mind. The other way that's also really helpful is to suggest someone else that would be great. Maybe there is someone who um, would be really great for this initiative, and you can actually act as a sponsor in this way. Um, so, so thinking about things proactively in that way. And so how do you kind of set, set yourself up for success so things like this don't happen in the future? One way is by setting and communicating goals before the problem arises. So if your mentor doesn't really know what your five or 10 year plan is, then maybe they're giving you the access to this opportunity because they think that that fits with what you want, but they don't know because you haven't communicated that it's not. Um, so really try to set and communicate goals early and often. And then the other thing I do kind of internally is before I say yes to anything, I determine what is now getting a no. You know, when you first start saying yes early and often is really helpful, but then by the time that you get kind of your calendar filled up and you have a lot of things on your plate, there's not really more hours to add to the day. And so if you're going to say yes to something, something has to be taken away and it really shouldn't be sleep and family time. You can only do that so much. Um, so think about what on your list can be dropped if you're gonna add something new. And then a really good skill is to learn how to give a positive no. I really recommend this book by William Urey called The Power of the Positive No. And what he talks about in this book is that in order to say no, you have to first kind of say yes to yourself and your own goals, your own personal life, your own time, say no to the actual thing being asked to, but then say yes to continuing the relationship with the person who is asking you something. So one way of giving um, a positive no is saying, this sounds like a really good opportunity. Unfortunately for me right now, I'm so busy with doing X that I don't think I'd be able to give it my full attention but I know someone who would be great for this. Why don't I connect you to this person who I know would really be interested in doing this? And that way it's kind of a win-win for both of you. So um, in, for all of these different kinds of mistakes that can happen, you know, the important ways to prevent them are first and fo foremost, open and honest communication. So about your goals, about mistakes that happen, you know, confronting things early is always helpful. If you do make mistakes, try to reframe them as a learning opportunity. And I actually see coming to the edge of what I know and making mistakes, not knowing the answer, means that I'm growing as a faculty member. So continue to kind of uh, think about uh, growth in that way. And then I've always found developing a peer mentorship group to be really helpful for some of these things. Both if I'm, <clears throat> so for example, conflict avoidance was always one of my big missteps and uh, using my peers to kind of talk about alternative strategies, to talk through my strategy, uh, to overcome an issue was really helpful in kind of gearing me up to then bring that up, uh, the chain of command, if uh, that's what I needed to do. So what about the other side of things? So now that we know what uh, great mentees should do, what should great mentors do? There have been um, a whole host of suggestions, but one that I thought was a really good compilation was um, six things every mentor should do. And this included choose mentees carefully. So just like mentees should do a good job of choosing mentors, the same should be true of the reverse. And so one thing I actually do when I'm, uh, when I'm thinking about mentees, especially now that I'm starting to get kind of more, more people wanting to be my mentee than I have bandwidth to carry, um, is, to, is to give them kind of a, a test. So someone will come to meet with me and I'll ask them to you know, read a paper and let me know what they think, or, um, you know, do a quick lit search and let me know if anybody's already answered the question that they've come up with or, or something. I give them some item to do. And most of the time I never hear back from them again, which is a win for both of us. It means that I didn't waste my time on someone who's not going to commit. And for them, it's also probably good that they didn't commit to something that they're not actually interested in. So doing some sort of kind of test ahead of time for your mentees to make sure that, you know, they're going to commit, given that it's so much energy that you're going to have to put in as well. Establishing a mentorship team, it's as helpful for you as a mentor as it is for your mentee, because you're not going to have the entire skill set to help them with everything. Running a tight ship. So, you know, this is where you can kind of set expectations and tell them things like, make sure you send me an agenda ahead of time, make sure that we establish a regular cadence of meetings, those kind of things, and then make sure that 
they set kind of their own timelines for getting things done, but that you hold them accountable for those timelines once they've set them. Um, I think it's also really helpful as mentors, especially in you know, this academic setting where there is such a hierarchy to help when there are problems, especially that occur above kind of a mentee's uh, role. So if there are issues that they're having with someone who's more senior to them, it really is helpful for you to either step in or provide actionable advice that they can use to kind of prevent some of those conflicts. And then really help prepare. Uh, prepare your mentee for the transition to becoming a mentor. So talking through some of the things that you might've done silently, but not kind of explained out loud to help them kind of understand what good mentorship looks like. And then don't commit mentorship malpractice. This article was the first article that uh, Vineet Chopra and my old mentor kind of wrote on mentorship and maybe the one that's talked about the most because I think a lot of us have experienced uh, mentors who maybe are not acting in the best way that a mentor could, not always on purpose, sometimes just because they're really busy or there are other issues in the background, but being able to recognize this is really helpful to being able to overcome it. And they talked about two types of mentorship. One that's active, which is kind of dysfunctional behavior that's easy to spot, it's maleficent, um, it's purposeful, it's deliberate. You should run away and not work with them as, as quickly as you can. But the more common type of mentorship malpractice is more passive. It's insidious, it's less easy to identify, it's typified by inaction rather than action. And fortunately, passive mentorship malpractice is, more, is, is easier in some ways to overcome and uh, often means that you should have, uh, uh, you know, use some more tools to overcome it rather than kind of run away immediately. So I wanna talk just briefly about the, the three types of passive mentorship malpractice um, and if you're interested in learning more about the active side, I encourage you to go to that article. But um, the one that's probably the most common, I think, is the bottleneck. So this is the mentor who is often maybe recently promoted, very busy, um, and they're pre preoccupied with their own priorities and really lack bandwidth or desire to become a committed mentor. So maybe they committed to too many, maybe they're guilty of overcommitting themselves, but really they're just too busy to kind of offer you the needs that or to, to address your needs and offer you the advice that you need. The country clubber is someone who really has a tough time, maybe they're conflict avoidant themselves with kind of fighting those battles that need to be fought for you um, and really view mentorship more as a ticket to popularity, but have a real hard time kind of making those tough decisions um, and taking responsibility for things. And then the world traveler, uh, not a problem now <laughs> uh, for the last year, but. Um, you know, outside of COVID times, the world traveler can be someone who, again, just is never around. So it's really hard to uh, kind of come up uh, and, and meet with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And some, some ways that you can deal with all of these, you know, um, the world traveler, uh, uh, some of my old mentors were that pre-COVID and we would have mentorship meetings over Zoom before Zoom was a thing, or we would have mentorship meetings in the Sky Lounge um, when we were both flying to different places. So it's really important to plan in advance for those mentors. Um, the bottleneck, really helpful to set deadlines ahead of time um, and, and kind of sometimes just to, to talk to them and say, you know, it seems like um, you've been very, very busy re recently. How can I make sure that, um, you know, we meet de deadlines um, given that I can't keep pushing back deadlines for grants or papers? So um, I'll talk about one of the other cases, the, the bottleneck is probably the most common type of um, malpractice that you have to overcome. And, you know, I've experienced it. I, I think I've probably been guilty of it before as well, although I try to kind of prioritize my mentee's needs and timelines. But let's say that, you know, you've had a mentor, you've worked together successfully, things have gone well before, but your mentor was just promoted to a new position, which requires more time. Since then, it's been difficult to find time to meet one-on-one. -on -one. She's rescheduled multiple meetings at the last minute and you just missed the deadline for a project submission because she didn't provide feedback or sign off on the project in time. So what type of mentorship malpractice is this? I already gave the hint for that. This would be of course the bottleneck, which I, like I said, I think is the most common type of mentorship malpractice. But then I'd like you to think about, you know, have you seen this in your life? What strategies have been successful for you and how can you fix this? Um, you know, some of the tricks that I've used to deal with people who have been bottlenecks in the past is, like I said, setting hard deadlines. Sometimes it's just, it's again, actually on the mentee who hasn't set a timeline 
and just shot off an email that was like, hey, can you read this when, when you can? Sometimes I actually will, will give fake deadlines. Um, you know, like uh, I know that something is due middle of May, but I ask for them for it back by May 7th. Um, and say, you know, and, and I try not to, to straight out lie, but, but say something like, I need this back by May 7th in order to submit it in time. And that's true. You do need something with a little bit of warning before a, a deadline. So doing that, I also sometimes will say, um, especially as I've, I myself have gotten more senior and more confident with submitting things, you know, I need this back by X date. If I don't hear from you by then, I will submit it um, and assume that you kind of agree with what I've submitted. So, and, but then if you do that, if you kind of make that threat, you have to follow through with it. So these are some ways, I think there's some people too that um, deal better with things in person. So, you know, uh, back when we could actually see people in person, it might be better just to drop by their office. And so I think learning a little bit about the style of the mentor that you work with is really helpful here. But overall, the kind of important things about mentorship malpractice is really not to be complicit, to learn how to recognize it, identify it, discuss it, and then set boundaries and communicate your needs. This is also where a mentorship team can be very helpful. Sometimes you can use uh, one mentor to kind of uh, bring the, the hammer down in another mentor, or you know, I'll, I'll, if, if there's like a paper I've written and I'm only waiting on one person for feedback, you know, letting the whole team know that we'll submit this as soon as we hear back from Dr. X, it makes Dr. X a lot, uh, um, respond a lot quicker. And then more for the active side of things, it's really important to know when to walk away and when to kind of uh, stop working so much with one person and work more with the other people on your mentorship team. Now let's switch gears and talk about diversity a little bit, because I think this is so important and we all have such power as people who are mentors and sponsors and to think proactively about what diversity looks like in mentorship. Um, so as we all know, kind of gender and race-based stereotypes and unconscious assumptions are alive and well. Uh, disparities and outcomes are persistent and striking. You know, when it comes to women, women are paid less for the same work. There's higher attrition in academic medicine. And then importantly, and what I want to focus on today, is that there's less access to mentorship and sponsorship for women. The same is true for people of color and underrepresented minorities in medicine. And so... Some suggestions, so this is actually from Malin Martinez, um, a resident in Northwestern who's also going to be giving a talk with me at the Society of Hospital Medicine about diversity and mentorship. And she kind of came up with these suggestions and tips for women and minority mentees. And the first was to stand up for yourself. It's really hard, but oftentimes if, if something happens, you internalize that and say, you know, this is this is, must be something I'm doing wrong for myself, but kind of recognize your own worth. Um, and if necessary, have peers to help you kind of recognize your own worth. Um, promote yourself and your accomplishments. Um, and then network, network, network. That's really important. And then peer mentorship can be helpful um, in this way because there's less access to kind of senior mentors, um, you know, try to get senior mentorship and sponsorship, but peer mentorship can also be a, help with, a helpful way to kind of supplement some of that. Um, and she, she has this wonderful uh, tweet that she kind of sent where she was going to um, leave Twitter and then her mentor said, remember as a Hispanic female researcher, it's key to have a platform to amplify your work, making it more impactful and helpful for career and promotion. And so with that, she decided to kind of stay on, on, on Twitter and help build her brand and use that as a way to kind of promote herself to network and to get peer mentorship. There's another um, talk that uh, one of my old sponsors or coaches at uh, the University of Michigan used to give, Jack Iwashina, where he talked about practical approaches for uh, men to sponsor women or underrepresented minorities. And I loved his list. This entire talk by him takes in itself 20, 30 minutes. So I won't go through this all, but some of the things he talked about, for example, were proactively nominating people. So this is again, sponsoring. Um, and he talks about how, you know, the, the more senior you get, the more likely you are to be invited to things that you actually don't wanna do anymore, but they're good opportunities for junior people. And so when you're thinking about kind of, instead of just saying no, say, you know, I can't do this, but I have a really great person who would be good for this talk and then proactively sponsor and think about who you're sponsoring and try to make sure that there's diverse representation in the mentees that you're sponsoring. 
He also talks about how he has made a public commitment that uh, you can see kind of on his website and on his Twitter page that he will not participate in any manals. And so whenever he gets invited to something, he says, I'm happy to attend. Um, I just wanna make sure it's a diverse representation on this panel because I've publicly committed not to be in any manals. If you have any needs for me to uh, provide names of some talented women or people of color uh, in this field, please let me know. And it's actually been really well received by some organizations. And he's had like one that it has not been well received at, and that's one that he no longer participates in. And then there's a self audit. So think about yourself and who you publish with, who you nominate for things. Um, if you're on Twitter or some other social media network, who do you follow? Who do you retweet? Who do you like? Think about that because the people that you kind of surround yourself with, if they all look like you, then maybe it's time to branch out a little bit because you're not gonna be able to expand your network and diversify your network unless you do so proactively. So think about kind of reflect on what's one strategy that you can use today, this month or this year to sponsor and proactively sponsor your mentees. And just briefly, I wanna talk about the, the mentorship program that we're building at the University of Utah. This is built off of a, a mentorship program that I helped lead the last year I was at the University of Michigan. Um, and it's called the UQAL Scholars, or the Utah Quality Advancement Laboratory Scholars. And the vision kind of our, of our hospital medicine research division is to grow a thriving quality improvement and research infrastructure that will support, train, mentor, and recruit outstanding hospitalists to enable continuous delivery of high quality inpatient care for Utahns. And what I really recognize is that if you look at clinical hospital medicine faculty, they really have absolutely amazing ideas about how to improve clinical care. They see it all every day. They can identify the problems that are going on, but they don't necessarily have the study design knowledge, the writing skills, or the access to the infrastructure in order to turn those great ideas into improvement opportunities. And so what I wanted to do was to help provide them with those things to take those ideas into practice to improve care for patients, but then also help uh, improve their academic uh, reputation to help them get promoted and also build the academic reputation of our section. Um, and so with that, we developed UQAL Scholars, which is a one-year mentored research and quality initiative program. We have four mentees every year. And over the year, there are 12 interactive classes on methods and writings where we're literally we walk mentees step by step through how to design and write a project. So before they actually start the research, they will have written their intro methods and fake results um, just so that they can think ahead of time about the study design about how to do something. This is a very mentored program. So they're actually protected time for two mentors, myself and another person who's a very, very strong kind of quality improvement background. Um, and then by having the four mentees this way, it creates a peer group. And then we also provide resources, a research coordinator and an analyst to help with some of the data analysis. And the key thing about this program is that it's not just, it happens every year, but once you've gone through it, you are asked to make a commitment to become a near peer mentor to the next group that comes through. So in this way, you're kind of paying it forward. It's the gift that keeps on giving. And we're actually in the first year training some, some faculty members who are a little bit more senior with the hopes that we know that they're already acting as mentors. So if you can provide the mentors with kind of the high quality research skills um, and study design skills, then they can actually provide it as they continue to mentor people in the future. So in conclusion, I hope we've learned kind of through this conversation today that mentorship is a two-way street. Mentors gain from um, their network and from satisfaction, and mentees gain from uh, a whole bunch of things related to career advancement. But mentorship is best as a team sport, and it's helpful to think about uh, mentors, sponsors, coaches, coaches, connectors, and peers in thinking about who your mentorship team is and thinking about who you uh, serve as a mentor to. It's the best way to avoid mentee missteps is with good communication and by setting goals and priorities. And then mentorship malpractice can threaten the mentee mentor relationship and lead to major problems for the mentee. It's best to kind of head that off through identifying it, um, open conversation, having a mentorship team and knowing when to walk away. And then proactive mentorship and sponsorship is really needed to help improve equity. And we all have a role to play in that, all have power by being mentors and helping to improve in that way. 
So before I end, I just wanna give a big thank to, thanks to all of my mentors and all of my mentees who I continue to learn from. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions, but I'm also happy to take them on Twitter or you guys can reach out to me by email afterwards. So thank you very much. Look forward to talking more about this. Great, thank you so much for a wonderful overview. Um, there's a question from Kristen Panther about um, recommendations for mentorship uh, across disciplines, um, interdisciplinary teams and how to go about that and um, just your thoughts. Yeah, no, so this is really helpful. I think actually, so, you know, hospital medicine is one example where we're kind of a relatively young field um, and thinking about the number of senior mentors available for the vast number, large growing number of junior people, there just aren't enough. Um, and so it's really, I think cross-disciplinary mentorship is actually critically important. And so like my mentor, my, my mentorship team, for example, has someone in pediatrics, um, a PhD researcher who's outside of um, internal medicine. And, and it really helps bring kind of diverse opinions and sometimes can also help um, kind of uh, bring an alternative perspective that you wouldn't have based on the people that you're normally surrounded with. I also do think though, it's really important to have someone with your, your, within your own division who knows a little bit more about kind of the internal politics. So this goes back to why it's really helpful sometimes to have a team. Um, and often actually having a mentor who's outside of your institution can be nice as well, because again, they can show you kind of alternatives to kind of the way that everyone around you might be thinking. So um, yeah, having kind of a, a group approach is really helpful for people kind of on a research track like I, like I am, you know, where, where grants were an important part of my career, bringing together that team once a year is also really helpful to get everybody on the same page. And you can use those group meetings also to kind of overcome any disagreements that might be going on by facilitating a conversation between people. Um, so yeah, I'm all pro uh, interdisciplinary mentorship and actually for some specialties, uh, you, you absolutely need it because there just aren't enough senior people. Yeah, so uh, I, I saw a question, sorry, I, about the- Go, uh, go for it, read it out loud. Uh, can you describe for us the institutional support that you have received to start and maintain the program you just described? Yeah, so I was um, uh, really lucky in that um, this is something that has been identified um, by the chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Utah as something that he strongly, strongly supports. You know, that our shared vision is that we think that our clinical faculty can actually improve care um, with their great ideas, but maybe don't know 100% how to do that. We also recognize that hospitalists um, and general internists um, are often the people that are mentoring our residents. So if you provide kind of a better infrastructure for faculty, they can provide better kind of mentorship for residents. So by providing this infrastructure, you're actually hitting the tripartite mission. You're helping clinical care, you're helping education, um, and you're helping research. And so we had quite a bit of a um, kind of infrastructure brought in from our chair. Uh, there's a clinical research coordinator who has dedicated effort to help with things like IRB submission, I have some protected time to do the work as well as the other, Stacey Johnson, who I mentioned, who's a, um, a researcher and also really uh, knowledgeable about quality improvement research. So he has some protected effort um, and we're working on hiring a data analyst to have some protected time as well. We were hoping to get some protected time for the faculty themselves who are the mentees, but that hasn't been confirmed for sure yet. You know, things have been hard with the, the COVID pandemic as I'm sure everyone's budgets know. But I think it is really important to have some sort of infrastructure to these programs to make sure that people do get the biggest chance for success as they go through them. Um, and then a question from Nasia uh, Safdar, which is actually similar to what I was thinking. You know, the, the um, transition from a mentee to independence, how do you navigate that separation from a mentee and mentor? Nasia, you probably have better experience with that uh, than I do. Um, but uh, cause I'm kind of uh, starting to go through that process myself right here. But I, I think it can be really difficult. You know, I think it's, um, there's a, um, you go from kind of 
being very close and needing to go to your mentor for a lot of things to be more independent. But I think uh, the mentor can really, really help with that, you know, proactively start saying, you know, this is a problem that you could have answered on your own. I don't think you need to come to me for this anymore. I remember the first time um, I kind of gave a talk or without having anybody kind of uh, um, watch it beforehand. You know, my mentors used to make me practice in front of them. And then there was a point where it was like, you don't need to practice in front of me anymore. You've got this. Um, so starting to do some of those things, I think if you, again, if you're on kind of this, uh, like a research track pathway, starting to do papers without your mentor on them, those are all ways that you can really help kind of uh, help with that transition. But often the mentee doesn't kind of know ahead of time to start doing those things. And so I actually think it's really helpful when the mentor can start pointing out, like, you don't need me for this anymore. Like, you've got this. Why don't you do this and kind of help navigate through that and help with some of the it can be, you know, hard on the confidence to go through that period without having someone to fall back on. And one thing I've actually found helpful is still your, your mentor can still be there for help. But, um, you, you know, like if you're the first time you mentor someone knowing that you can go to your mentor for help is really is really nice, even if it's mainly your responsibility. Same thing with the first paper that you've seen your author, knowing that you can still kind of go to your mentor and say, I know I'm supposed to be the one that knows everything, but I don't, can you help me with this? Um, and then you realize that no senior author knows everything and we all ask for help. So um, those are some great ways to kind of do that. Yeah, I would also add clear communication with your mentor especially if you're going to a different institution with a research project, um, very clear what is going to stay, what is going to go with you is very helpful. Um, from uh, one of our chief residents, Lauren Banachek, is there any data or precedent for a program similar to UQAL scholars being effective or feasible for our residents or fellows? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know so much the literature around residents or fellows. I know there was a great paper published out of the University of Washington looking at a clinical coach for faculty that found a lot of success, increased number of publications, good return on investment for grants. Um, I know at Michigan before I left, uh, you know, in the final year, two of the four people that went through the program have already submitted a publication, one of which was accepted as an oral abstract for our national society. So I know that these things can be very successful for faculty and I'm sure similar things can be successful for residents. I just don't, I don't know the literature as well. Great. And a question from Shobi Chetta. Do you have any experience or use on um, using the leadership style surveys um, as a way to match mentors and mentees or helping them ne uh, negotiate their relationships? Oh yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, I definitely during my fellowship we did those leadership style things, and I think it's very helpful to kind of know yourself and know your leadership style. One thing that's really hard and like mentor mentee matching is that I do think it's just really hard to kind of match all of those things, right? Like personality plus interest plus availability um, plus just happening to know the person and being at the right place at the right time for that connection to be made. It's really hard. And I think one thing that is really important is learning to work with people of all types <laughs> kind of in our jobs. And so it's hard to match based solely on personality, but knowing your own personality can help you kind of work with diverse, diverse personalities. Um, and then being able to identify some things about them and whether it's uh, just odd quirks versus something that is a bad behavior that you should steer clear of is really helpful as well. Um, but having, again, kind of the team, the diversity of kind of ways of behaving can actually be helpful and can help you learn how to kind of navigate different personalities, which you'll have to do for the rest of your life. Um, then a question from Jackie Cruiser about um, what's your, your thoughts on uh, asking mentees to develop their own ideas for projects? versus um, having them integrate into work that is already ongoing and taking up a, a part of an ongoing project, research project? Yeah, that's great. Um, I think that's a tough question. I have found far more success in being like, here are the three potential projects I have, choose <laughs> one you love and go with it. Because I think it's hard when you're, uh, you know, uh, med student or a resident or even a fellow sometimes to know enough about the area to know what a good question is 
And it requires a lot of background research just to know that someone else hasn't already done what you're interested in. And so by being kind of an expert in, in a field, you know what is still out there, what's still interesting, what's still publishable, but being able to offer like a couple of different options, a couple of different methodologies and um, can, be, can be one way. And then letting the mentee kind of take the, the nugget of an idea and run with it can also be fun for them. Great. Well, we're out of time. Um, I want to thank you so much for a wonderful overview. Um, and uh, hopefully we can get you here in person at some point. Um, uh, I actually happen to know your new chair. We worked when he was a resident at UCSF and I work with him in Washington as well. So um, he, he's a wonderful uh, mentor and um, gives a great talk on communication styles for mentors as well. Um, so thank you, everybody, uh, and we will see you next week. Take care. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.